Hi, everybody. My name is Nisha Trivedi, and I'm a senior consultant with MBA Mission. And today I'm here to talk to you about the waitlist process. Um, I know that being waitlisted by MBA programs can feel, you know, like you're in limbo and you're just kind of frustrating because you're probably wondering, well, I'm, I'm not in. Um, but at the same time, you know, I haven't been denied by the school, so that must be a good sign, right? And the answer is yes. Um, you know, being waitlisted means that you are definitely seen as a viable candidate by the schools. It just means, though, that they need a little bit more time um, and data to make their decision. Um, so today I'll be conducting a presentation on um, how to manage being waitlisted. And then I'll uh, tell you just a little bit about MBA mission and then I will, um, and then I'll take your questions. Um, so with that, uh, let's get started on the presentation. Okay, sorry. Sorry guys, one second. Okay, so again, we're going to be talking for, about strategies for getting off the wait list. Um, you know, so the first thing we'll talk about is, you know, what does it even mean to be waitlisted? Um, you know, at the beginning, I alluded to the fact that it's, you know, it, it can be a little bit uncertain, but we'll kind of help you decode what the situation means. Um, um, sorry, we'll uh -huh. sorry to interrupt. Can you please share your screen? It's not um, I thought I did share it. Okay, sorry, one second. Okay. Now you. Okay. Um, sorry about that. So again, you know, just today we're going to talk about strategies for getting off the waitlist. Um, and what we're going to talk about is, you know, first of all, what does it mean to be waitlisted? Um, you know, how do you kind of decode the situation that you're in? Um, next, we'll talk about the nuances of waitlist management. So in other words, you know, what are the different ways that you manage the process of being waitlisted specifically, and um, in some cases by program? Um, then we'll talk about, okay, what do you do next? You know, what do you do in this, this waiting time period? And then I'll just tell you a little bit about MBA mission and when we'll jump into some Q&A. Um, so the first part is, you know, what does the wait list even mean? Um, you know, it, sometimes, like I said at the beginning, it, it, it can mean you, you feel like you're in limbo. So, you know, as you can see, the lyrics of the song stuck in the middle with you, which I will not sing because nobody will hear wants that. Um, you know, it kind of captures the experience of being waitlisted for some people. Um, and to, so does this quote by uh, George Bernard Shaw. It says, the frontier between hell and heaven is only the difference between two ways of looking at things. So, you know, there's a couple of ways you can look at being waitlisted. One of them is to say like, oh, you know, I haven't gotten in, I'm frustrated, you know, I just don't know what to do next. Uh, the other way to look at it is, you know, I'm still being considered by the program. You know, I might still need to wait, you know, out the process, but it means that they think I'm a viable candidate. And I think that's, a, uh, that's definitely a more optimistic and just a better way of looking at things for sure. Um, you know, a lot of times people ask themselves, um, or me, you know, for, for people I'm working with, you know, does a wait list, does that mean that I'm not good enough, you know, to go to the school? Um, the answer is absolutely not. It does not mean that because if you were not a good enough applicant, if the school felt like, you know what, this program, this person is just not a fit for this program, they wouldn't wait list you. They would just reject you and programs, you know, do that all the time. Um, the admissions committee is incredibly busy. You know, they, they don't have time to play games. You know, why would they wait list you if they didn't? consider you a viable candidate. That would just be a waste of their time. That's just more people to manage. Um, and there's just no, they have no motivation to do that. Um, but, you know, admissions committees, they do have the luxury of keeping their options open. There are multiple rounds um, in an admission cycle. And, you know, as they're trying to build a diverse class, as they're trying to pick the top candidates, they want to make sure that they're making the best decision possible, uh, which is not an easy job. And so for that, they, they like to see, you know, their choices laid out in front of them. Um, but bottom line is, the, the point of being waitlisted is that you are admissible. Um, so definitely, you know, view it as positive. And just to give you some proof from admissions committees, you know, Tuck has said flat out, since Tuck puts very few people on the waitlist, you should view this as a positive response. You know, Haas says, um, we find your strengths and accomplishments stand out among the majority of our applicants. So the majority of the applicants didn't even get to be on the wait list. Um, they were um, declined by the school. So if you're on the wait list, you're in that you know positive minority. Um, Stanford has says, you know, the wait list is a group of hand selected applicants. It's not a consolation prize. It's not an empty courtesy. They're not leading you on. They have they see this pool of people who could very well make it into the class. 
And Booth says, the AdCon feels that you'll be a fit with our unique, inquisitive, and supportive community at Booth. So, you know, they see you as a potential fit. They just need to, they need more time and more information to make their decision. Um, so, you know, sometimes people say like, well, I mean, there's gotta be other people on the wait list. Like, what are my chances anyway? Um, and the schools have something to say about this as well. You know, Stanford has said they select 80 candidates from the wait pool. Um, they've had wait, wait pools from 75 to 200. You know, sometimes they admit a high percentage of the wait pool, sometimes not so much. It really just depends. So, you know, I, I often get the question, well, what is my percentage chance of getting off the wait list? And I honestly can't answer that because it just varies from year to year and from school to school. And HBS says, you know, the number of admissions officers uh, offers extend to waitlist candidates, they vary from year to year. Um, and it's, you know, it's difficult to predict. Um, historically, anywhere between 50 to 60 candidates have been admitted off the waitlist any year. But that doesn't mean it's going to be every year 50 to 60, right? It, it varies. This is just a rough estimate on their part. Um, and then, you know, Sloan says, you know, we likely have between 100 and 200 active candidates on the wait list. So that's just kind of to give you a rough sense of where these schools are, but it is not um, at all you know, it, it's not at all just a hard and fast rule. This is just to give you just a few rough parameters. Um, and then, you know, Kel a few more schools have stuff to say about this. Um, Kellogg says that, you know, it's basically what they're saying is, hey, this is not predictable, but we wouldn't have people on the wait list if we weren't planning to admit some of them. Um, you know, Duke makes it clear that the wait list is limited. Um, you know, just like I've said, they are not going to put people on the wait list that they don't uh, think that they want to admit. Um, and Stern um, reinforces the fact that there's no, you know, there's no predetermined number of waitlisted applicants or people percentage of uh, those waitlisted applicants who will get off the list. Um, another question I get a lot is, well, the list, I mean, where, where am I, where do I stand? Where am I ranked on it? Um, and all the schools say in different words, but exact same message, they do not rank the waitlists. Um, really what they're trying to do is, um, and before we move on just a little bit more about this, what they're trying to do is, you know, figure out the diverse class, right? And, you know, they're not ranking people as in, okay, this person is number one, this person is number two, because they know that everybody has different gifts to offer to the class and they want to make it as diverse as possible in terms of nationality, in terms of profession, in terms of every definition of diversity you can think of. Um, and so as they evaluate, continue to evaluate the pool, they think to themselves, okay, you know, how can we, you know, further diversify this class? How do we add on, um, you know, folks that would make the class, you know, even more you know, representative of the cross section of, um, you know, fantastic, um, you know, professionals we have um, around the world. So again, no ranking on the wait list. Um, now the, we'll talk about the, the nuances of wait list management and, you know, what you can do um, to be proactive uh, if you find yourself in the situation. Um, so first of all, you know, you want to strike a balance. You don't want to be completely silent in this process. You want to advocate for yourself. But you don't want to overdo it, right? You know, this is not something where you don't want to keep, you know, bugging them in this program every week and saying, okay, am I in? Am I in? You definitely don't want to do that. Um, the second point is you don't want to take a one size fits all approach. Um, different schools have different preferences, and we're going to talk about this a little bit. Different preferences in terms of how do they want to be contacted and how often. Um, number three, this is probably obvious, but you want to be thoughtful and professional in all of your correspondence because every, let's say, every email or phone call that you, um, that you make to the admissions office, uh, it, it gets logged. It's a part of your file. So you want to make sure that you're being uh, professional at all, all times. Um, number four, um, and this this should apply to all of any interactions you have professionally, is you don't want to be you know desperate. You you want to project confidence. Um, number five, and this is where you know you want to give your application an objective look over, right? Now that it's probably been a few months since you've submitted it, if you're waitlisted for uh, applying round one, um, you know, look at your test scores and think, you know, are they in line with the average scores for the MBA programs? Um, your quantitative ability, so that's going to be reflected by your quant subscore of the GMAT or the GRE, um, you know, quantitative coursework you've taken, you know, whether in college or post-college, quantitative skills you've shown at work, you know, do you think, you know, in your application or just your profile in general, have you shown strong quantitative ability, which the schools can consider important for um, being able to handle the rigor of the programs? Uh, number three, your recommendations, you know, are they, you know, did your recommenders provide not only positive endorsements, but also, you know, detailed enough endorsements in terms of your strengths, your strengths versus peers, um, as well as your potential and your growth. 
Um, oftentimes, wait lists uh, or programs rather, they encourage waitlisted applicants to uh, submit an additional recommendation. Um, for example, you know, Duke Fugo is one of those schools. So if you think that a third recommendation that can provide a different perspective could be beneficial, think about, you know, who some of those, um, you know, some of those people could be. Uh, fourth year academic professional info. Um, did you communicate your goals as clearly as you could have? Did you communicate your specific interest in the program based on its culture, based on its resources within and outside the classroom? Um, and number five, you know, your extracurricular engagement. You know, have you shown um, that you have the ability to show leadership, you know, outside of work and that you have the potential to be involved outside the classroom uh, when you're at the business school program. And they'll be gauging that by your professional, your extracurricular involvement, both uh, in college as well as post-college. Um, so see if you, you know, do you have enough of that involvement? And, you know, if you do, have you communicated that fully in your application? Um, there are different types, schools that have different approaches to the wait list. Um, you know, some schools say, you know, you're welcome to communicate with us, but make sure you send us critical information only, right? Um, so Ross, for example, they will, um, you know, you're going to provide one update decision per round, letting them know of significant changes to your application. So this is a job change, this is a promotion, this is some sort of award, you know, whether at work or in the community, um, you'd submit this online. Um, the exception is if you take uh, your test again, so the GMAT, GRE, or TOEFL, um, this you can submit anytime, as soon as you have that updated score, you know, send that in. But, you know, you're not, this isn't a program where you're gonna be writing them every three, four weeks with an update. Um, you know, Kellogg is saying, you know, you can provide general, you know, pretty, pretty much the same, um, no specific information they want, but general updates in terms of, again, job changes, promotions, new extracurricular involvement, um, changes in test score, changes in personal situation. This is the type of information you want to give catalog. So again, the most important information. Um, Stern is also saying, you know, new information if it's material, if it a, provides a different or updated perspective, you know, um, which means that, you know, it's not just about, oh, you know, I, um, you know, you know, I did this, you know, one time, maybe this one time volunteer activity, uh, maybe not so much. But if you have a substantial increase in involvement, you know, that's something you'd want to um, communicate to them. Um, Booth is a bit unique in terms of its approach. It has a, an open um, waitlist policy, which means that you'll, um, you know, they do welcome hearing from you, but they have a specific system for this. So when you're waitlisted at a booth, and some of you guys might have gotten this communication, um, they want you to submit relevant updates in a particular form. In this case, uh, optional 300 word essay or a 45 second waitlist video. And they want you to address one of the following questions. Why booth? Why is now the right time for you to pursue your MBA? What are your goals post MBA and how your MBA help accomplishment? So you want to, you know, in order to figure out, well, which of these three questions you're going to answer, you want to figure out, well, what in which of these questions do I do I feel like could have answered maybe in more detail in my application, right? If you feel like your goals were mentioned very, very clearly and your motivations were clear, um, you know, then maybe you don't want to get into that as much. But, you know, maybe if you feel like, oh, there are other aspects of Booth that, you know, really interest me, and I don't know if I communicated it in the process, you know, the interview or the application, then maybe you'll want to get into that. Um, so, you know, definitely do some careful thinking. Um, and, you know, in any case, you want to make sure you provide insight into your qualifications and your strength of fit with Booth beyond what was presented in your original application, right? So really, again, think about the ways in which your original application where you could augment um, their understanding of one of these three questions about you. Um, some wait lists are wide open. You know, they don't say only, you know, send material information, send it in this format. You know, some schools are just saying, hey, you know, update us when you when you wish. Um, you know, Yale feels that way. Here, here's our email address, you know, send us uh, addition, additional materials. Um, ha says that, you know, um, anything that you feel, you know, using your best judgment, provides a substantive and meaningful improvement to your application um, or an important just in person piece of information about your, yourself they need to know that wasn't in your original application, you know, send that to Haas. Um, and then um, MIT says, you know, keep us updated on your situation, you know, any additional information you feel like it'll be helpful, you know, submit it. But, you know, this doesn't mean that wide open means like send them anything you want, any thought you have in terms of, oh, why I'm interested in Sloan or Haas or um, Yale SOM. No, you still really want to use your judgment. Um, this just means that you can be a little bit more flexible in your thinking in terms of, okay, what information is material enough to send to them? But again, you still want to show your judgment. 
Um, and again, to, to sum that up, it's that you're advocating for yourself. What you're not doing is campaigning, right? This isn't the presidential election where you're, you know, sending a message every, you know, every day, you know, just like you've probably seen on social media, those of you who are in the US um, for the presidency, you want to send maybe just a few pieces of correspondence per round, right? Um, maybe one to three, you know, the schools that say one, you know, per round honor that, um, but probably not more than a few. Um, and again, it depends on, you know, how long you've been on the wait list and, you know, what, what does a school specifically say? What do they want? Um, you know, maybe one to two letters of recommendation, depending on how long you've been on the wait list. Maybe this isn't something you do in the first couple of weeks, but, you know, if it's been a little while, you might think about, oh, you know, who else could provide a new perspective? Um, and again, these letters, you know, they should provide new information, right? Maybe it's a, it's a perspective that you haven't had, um, you know, from somebody who, you know, can see you in a different light professionally, you know, based on different projects, based different interactions, or maybe even someone from your extracurricular involvement um, who knows you extremely well and has um, witnessed your, you know, your performance, your leadership, your growth, um, those sorts of important dimensions. And of course, you know, significant um, updates, you definitely want to give updates that are significant, right? So that means you improved your GMAT or GRE score, you got a promotion or you um, had some significant professional success, some recognition, increase in responsibility, the substantive awards. So again, this can be um, professional or extracurricular um, like community awards. Um, professional academic info. So maybe you've, you know, for the open wait list, you know, you can tell them about, let's say additional interactions you've had with the uh, community. Um, you know, maybe you maybe you had coffee with an alum and, you know, it really just helped reinforce how interested you are in the school or you learned about a new program that just, you know, made you think, you know, if I'm accepted at this you know, in, in this institution, I'm really going to take advantage of that. Um, maybe you sat in on a class, which you didn't have a chance to do before. And it really showed you that the academic dynamics are, you know, some that you'd be very interested in participating someday. Um, and then any achievements in the professional and professional and personal sphere um, are what you would want to communicate as well. Um, so here's just, I'm, I'm going to go through quickly just some um, examples of what's considered an effective advocacy. Um, so not just a message, just, you know, talking about random things, but very focused. So here's an example. Um, since receiving my waitlist decision a month ago, I've determinedly continued to learn more about ABC School to be best prepared to join the class should the opportunity arise. Last week, I visited campus, eager to experience a class dis discussion firsthand. I admittedly did not expect the man manic energy and humor that Professor Paul Johnson brought to the Finance 2 class, but admin admit his sprints to the board and rapid fire questioning of the unsuspecting. I learned a profound lesson on the connection between inventory management and working capital needs. I was sold on the case method before my visit, but my experience with the Clarkson Lumber case only reinforced that this is the ideal active learning style for me. I should add that I was fortunate to join the learning team of my former colleague, Mary Flanagan, a fellow McKinsey alumna, that evening and observed the team dissect that next day's cases. Seeing her engaged in such a collaborative setting learning environment made me certain that I would be a solid fit both academically and socially, right? So they didn't just say, hey, you know, I visited class and I really liked it, you know, um, and I got to see one of my friends. No, they, they said, what is it about the class specifically that made them think, you know, I, I really see myself here in, the, in this classroom. And, you know, based on somebody specifically I know well and I've interacted with, I have reason to believe that this is the right program for me. So they're being specific here and they're painting a picture. Um, you know, there, here's another example. Um, and this is about, uh, a, a professional update, right? And at McKinsey, uh, this person is working on a new project um, and they're talking about how much they're learning from this project. Um, you know, the responsibilities they've had, they've met with the firm CEO, the firm's vice president. So that's definitely a step up in responsibility. Um, and again, what they've learned from these interactions um, and an accomplishment. They made an introduction for the client to a private equity firm single-handedly. Um, and so this experience, um, you know, so not only they, are they conveying their learnings and accomplishments from this experience, but they're talking about how it's reinforced their goals, right? They decided, you know what, based on this, I want to re return to McKinsey after completing my MBA. Um, I talked about it in my personal statement, but this experience just reinforced it to me. And then, you know, this is... Uh, an accomplishment. This is about a community um, accomplishment. Um, this person is talking about how they remain committed to the Golden Heights Senior Center. They lead bingo every Sunday and they play in the house band each Wednesday night. So this is presumably something that was communicated in the application, right? Because they're saying I remain committed uh, as though the admissions committee already know this, but they're adding new information. 
Last month, I also organized a weekend trip for 20 seniors to the Super Casino and arranged to play bingo there and attend an instrumental show with an acoustic Beatles tribute band. Um, and this was an unforgettable experience. And um, so they just wanted to make sure they share that with the admissions committee because it's a it's a community accomplishment, right? It's they went above and beyond uh, what they usually did uh, for this um, for this organization. Um, and then here's another um, update that's a bit more straightforward. So this is they're notifying the admissions committee of um, some you know, academic accomplishments they've had. So they completed a calculus and a statistics, a statistics course um, at a local extension school and they got A's, which is which is key if you're taking supplemental coursework. Um, and they did this in order to uh, prove their quantitative proficiency. And they wrote a note saying that they're going to submit their transcript uh, as soon as they're available, which is exactly what, what you wanna do, but they wanted to make sure they, admit, they uh, updated the admissions committee ASAP um, so that they could take this information into consideration about this candidate. Um, and so here's another update you'll see. So this is to um, update the admissions committee on an improved GMAT score. Um, so that's exciting. And they paired this with an update about uh, lunch they had with uh, with an alum and how much they, um, you know, how much they showed, you know, there they saw through this alum how enthusiastic he was about the school, even though, you know, class of 67, so quite a while ago, but they still are excited about the school. And that, you know, that gave this candidate uh, excitement. So, you know, it, it's just something that you know, he wanted to share with the admissions committee to show, you know, not only have I improved the GMAT, but I've had these interactions um, with, uh, I had this additional interaction with an alum that just reinforced my excitement about the program. Um, and then, you know, some schools, you know, Harvard and Stanford in particular are a little bit um, more closed in terms of their wait list, right? So, you know, it's not that they're completely closed to communication, but they don't, they don't welcome these, you know, super regular updates, they have more of a structure. So, you know, Stanford has a, a step where you're to, you know, shortly after getting the decision about being updated, a bit about being waitlisted, you're supposed to upload a letter into this um, next step section of your application. Um, after that, they don't really want you to um, submit additional, have additional submissions. Um, and then HBS um, is actually very recently, they've changed the process a little bit. So for those of you waitlisted at round, in round one, you might have uh, noted that um, HBS invited everyone to uh, submit a, an update. Um, I believe the date was like December 17th, if I'm not mistaken, um, where you, it basically asked you about, you know, a, a 400 word update for, you know, what has changed, you know, since you uh, last submitted your application. So that's when you really want to think about what additional information do they really need from me at this time. Um, and then, you know, for these closed wait lists, those that are, you know, not as quite as open to any piece of information. Um, you want to make sure that, um, you know, in most cases, just, you know, submitting one update um, to their specifications is what you need to do. You want to um, provide new info and perspective on that in that letter. And, you know, if you happen to have an alumni connection, um, you know, somebody who graduated from the program, they're doing well, they know you well, you know, they might be able to put in a word um, through, you know, there, there are different schools have different processes. Sometimes it's as simple as them emailing the admissions committee. Sometimes there's a form they can fill out. Um, so see if that's something that you can do. It's not completely crucial. Not everybody knows an alum, but if you do, you know, see if you can work that connection. Um, and certainly you'll want to update them of significant achievements, not just anything, but significant achievements. So that means um, GMAT improvement, completion of quant scores, prom promotion, or other type of significant professional success, and awards, both professional and um, perhaps community or other extracurricular. Um, and then here's a, here's an example of what a short and sweet um, waitlist update would look like um, for schools that really just want maybe one update um, and only on really critical information. So this person is updating on their uh, GMAT score increase and in particular their quantitative score increase um, and a promotion. Um, so these are definitely uh, very significant updates, which a school would really appreciate learning about. Um, and then, you know, people probably, you know, a lot of people ask me, well, you know, I need to be assertive, right? So should I be, should I err on the side of being a little forceful? Um, you know, the schools have something to say about that. You know, they, and, and sometimes people specifically ask me, well, should I try to make a, you know, an appointment with the admissions office? Should I call them? You know, can I do that? And, you know, these schools are thinking, you know, that, their their view is that you should not. Um, Wharton says, um, you know, in this first quote, they want 
to be fair to everyone. Um, they don't want you to feel pressured to keep expressing your interest. Um, it, in Wharton, they know that if you're still on this list, if you've spent all this time, you know, interviewing, applying, they, they know you're interested. So they don't, and they also don't offer feedback. They want to make sure that they make that clear because a lot of times people also wonder, should I be asking this uh, them for feedback? Um, you know, Harvard says flat out, we're not going to, you know, you, we're not going to set up a meeting for you with admissions with a board member. Um, Kellogg says the same thing, not going to meet with you in person. Um, so then you're wondering, okay, well, that's a lot of information, uh, you know, some specific to schools, there's specific different types of wait lists, what do I do next? And, you know, it, it can be, you know, just to set expectations, it can sometimes be a, a, a long ride, you know, sometimes people are admitted off the wait list, it depends, you know, as early as early spring, right? Um, you know, sometimes it's made on a rolling basis, right? It can be anywhere from, let's say, next month to all the way up to the summer. Um, sometimes, you know, waitlist decisions are made in round two, um, where they kind of, they see the round two applicants and they can kind of make a basis of, okay, what are we going to do with this, this round one candidate? Sometimes they do this in round three. So they consider the waitlisted applicants along with the round three applicants to see, okay, how are things shaking out? Um, some decisions are made after round three done is done and classes are taking shape. So now they have everyone kind of out on the table, so to speak, and they can kind of figure out, okay, how many spots do we have? Who do we have on our wait list? What are the optimal decisions? Sometimes um, decisions are made a week a week before uh, an MBA program starts. I worked with a guy a few years ago who was on the Wharton wait list. Um, and, you know, he provided, you know, a few updates, not too many, but some substantive ones. Um, and then, you know, he got a call uh, a few days before preterm was to start from the admissions committee. And they asked him, they said, look, I think we have a few people who are not going to show up to preterm. Um, I'll know for sure Monday. If that is the case, are you still interested in a spot in the class? He said, yes, that's exactly what it turned out happened. And he ended up, you know, within a few days, moved to Philly, found a place. It was kind of a whirlwind, but totally worth it. And uh, he graduated and he's really happy. Um, sometimes even a week into the MBA program, so people, you won't believe it, but it happens. People get off the wait list and, um, you know, at, at another school, they're at one school and they, and they, um, they ended up, they ended up kind of skipping down. It, it's not super common, but it, it's happened. So sometimes it, you're, you're really in it for the long haul. Um, you know, what if you wait and wait, and then ultimately you just, you don't get in and th this can happen. Um, you know, sometimes schools, you know, when all is said and done, they will give waitlisted applicants feedback um, and they do encourage people to reapply. Right. And, you know, sometimes they'll proactively say, you know, we encourage you to reapply um, next year. Um, and, you know, they mean this, they, you know, because if, if they felt like you're a viable candidate one year, you know, why wouldn't they want to see you reapply? Um, but at the same time, you want to show improvement um, in your next application. Um, and so with that, you know, in order to make sure you can improve, you want to honestly assess your candidacy. Um, you know, think about your um, your quantabilities, your GMAT score, how clear were your goals, how clear was your reason for being interested in that particular program, extracurriculars, you know, are those meaningful? Um, and, you know, it says quantabilities here twice, but I think that's good because um, you definitely do want to show strong quantitative ability, especially if you studied a non-quantitative subject in undergrad or if your work doesn't involve um, you know, many quantitative aspects. So you want to make sure that you're showing that somewhere, whether it's through your test scores, whether it's through work, whether it's through supplemental coursework. Um, and, you know, one of the resources we have is our MBA mission waitlist guide. Um, so definitely download that for free on our site. And it gives some good uh, advice and direction on how do you communicate with open and closed waitlist schools, um, as well as, you know, just like you've seen examples in this deck, it has notes of, you know, how do you appropriately structure your correspondence to the admissions committee so that you're leaving a good impression and you're communicating the information that they want to see. All right, so next I'll tell you just a little bit about MBA Mission and then I'm very happy to take any questions. Um, so MBA Mission, um, we are the highest ranked uh, firm on GMAT Club uh, based on our positive reviews, number one ranked on quotes and quants. Um, you know, one of the very unique aspects of MBA Mission is that all of our consultants are full time. Um, you know, there are a lot of admissions consultants and consulting firms out there, but the majority of them, they have part time consultants, which means they're balancing their client load with a full time job, um, you know, doing something totally different. Whereas this is our full time job. We spend our time day in and day out 
helping candidates put their best foot forward uh, in front of the admissions committee. Um, so, you know, we're always keeping in touch, you know, with uh, our fellow consultants, you know, there's about 25 of us, let's say, and we're always asking each other for advice and that sort of thing. So if you work with one of us, you're working with many of us. Um, and, you know, we have a conference every year. Um, this year it's in May and uh, we share our best practices um, during this conference. Um, and uh, again, we're always keeping up with best practices because this is a calling for us. And, you know, if you enjoyed this event, definitely check out our Manhattan Prep events as well. They're uh, listed on our website. Here's a list of our free resources. Um, so go check those out. Um, oh, and if you haven't done this already, definitely uh, set up a free 30 minute consultation with an MBA mission senior consultant. Um, you can talk to me or any one of my colleagues. We'd be happy to talk to you about your profile and your goals and um, the schools that you're interested in. Um, and here's just a list of our services. You can find out more online. Um, here's a, just a selection of some of our consultants, as you can see, you know, very diverse and very accomplished group of people uh, who have just done some really cool things. Um, so, yeah, so um, that's the presentation. Um, again, sign up for a free consultation if you haven't already, either with me or with one of my colleagues. Um, check out our free resources. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I am going to, um, I'll be happy to take your questions. All right, so uh, let's see there. Um, one question is saying how many students from the prior year waitlist were able to convert their waitlist status? And as you probably saw in one of the slides, um, this really can vary from year to year. So uh, definitely it's it's really hard to say. Um, and it can, you know, it depends on the year, it depends how many people are waitlisted. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, nuances to that. And then Anshu is asking, um, what about applicants who are waitlisted without an interview? What can they do? Um, that's a good question. I would say the advice is um, pretty much the same, um, is that, you know, depending on the school's, what they've communicated to their waitlisted applicants in terms of what they can, um, what sort of updates they should give and how often, um, you definitely want to keep in touch with them um, and show your, you know, your interest. Um, and then you want to take a critical look at your application. You know, should I increase my GMAT or GRE score? Did I communicate my goals um, clearly enough? Um, and then, you know, they, you know, at that point, they'll, you know, be able to review the information as it comes in and invite you to interview. Um, oftentimes, you know, though, sometimes before the, before the applicant even has a chance to do this, they might get an interview invitation. I've seen that happen as well. So um, just know that they know where to find you um, and they'll definitely make a decision to interview you when they're ready. But in the meantime, um, just be sure to follow their directions in terms of how often they'd like to be communicated and, and how. Are we ready for the next question? Okay, um, so yeah, GMAT Club's asking, um, does a school visit make any impact on your chances of getting off the wait list? That's a good question. I think that, and especially for these open wait list schools that I mentioned, um, I think that it can help, especially if you haven't been before, right? If you have, then um, what your, your time might be best spent talking to students and alumni remotely or going to local events in your area. Sometimes um, some cities have coffee chats, that sort of thing. So take advantage of that. Um, but if you haven't visited the school, then um, definitely, you know, do so. Um, and if you can, it's if it's within your schedule, if it's within your budget. Um, and then what you can do is, you know, go on a class visit, take a tour, try to have uh, coffee with students and alum. Um, and then what you can do is then report back to, you know, the admissions and say, you know, hey, I had this visit. Um, and here are the specific things that I learned, right? And I think as you saw in one of the slides, um, the candidate who was waitlisted provided a very specific uh, note in terms of his visit. He didn't just say, hey, I, I went on a class visit and it was awesome. And now I really want to go to your school. He said, what was it about the class? Um, you know, it was the professor's uh, just how dynamic he was, even though it was a finance class, so potentially be a little uh, more on the dry side. Um, you know, how the students interacted with, the, with one another, um, how he got, had a chance to visit one of his old colleagues and hear about her experience and how that reinforce the interest in the program. So, you know, you definitely want to, when you go on a 
visit, um, if you can do that, you definitely want to take it all in and be able to absorb some details in terms of how is that reaffirm your interest in the program. And then um, in terms of, okay, so this applicant is uh, waitlisted by Anderson. Um, is there, you know, if you're coming from a competitive pool, is there any other bet? I would say for Indian applicants, and I actually, uh, for MBA Mission, I did a study um, at our conference a couple of years ago on Indian and Chinese applicants specifically, because these happen to be two quite heavily represented groups in the applicant pool. And one of the things that, one of my findings, just based on the, the client data that I had available to analyze, is that GMAT scores are really important. So probably not much of a surprise, but what we've seen is that the the clients who had succeeded tended to have a GMAT score of at least, I would say, 730 plus. Um, so I think that, you know, it, it really depends. I can't really comment on whether that's the biggest, you know, factor in terms of your profile and improving it. But I can say a 720 is, you know, uh, while it's it just, it's considered objectively a solid score, right? But given you're from such a competitive pool, definitely, if you can boost it, um, I think that could only be to your benefit. Um, so GMATS Club is asking, what's the latest time you can hear about your waitlist decision? Um, yeah, so this, it can be anywhere from, you know, March, let's say, from, you know, when they evaluate the round two applicants, um, or maybe even, I think some schools, they even say they might make some decisions in February, all the way until the start of class. So you never know. Like I said, I worked with somebody who um, got off the work and wait list uh, be right before pre-term in August. Um, and I've worked with uh, people who found out and, you know, got decisions in um, February and March in either direction. So it really varies. It depends on how many people are on the wait list, what their various applicant pools look like for round two, round three, um, and just how often they're making decisions. Okay. Like, okay. So it looks like that's all we have for Q and A. Um, again, thank you so much for listening. Um, you know, really appreciate it. Um, and again, if um, if you haven't signed up for a free consultation with um, one of our consultants, I'd say definitely do that. We can talk more about your case. Um, and uh, check out the waitlist guide, um, as GMAT Club has pointed out, and our slides have pointed out. And um, yeah, again, very best of luck to you. Um, and just remember, if you're waitlisted, you're, um, that means that the schools consider you a viable candidate. So please, you know, be optimistic. And actually, it looks like we do have one more question. So happy to answer that. Um, waitlisted. So this can, this um, candidate was waitlisted for the MBA. Um, so we actually don't, unfortunately, we don't have stats for that either. The same rules apply for the EMBA. The, um, the waitlist pool uh, can vary from year to year. And your chances of getting off just sort of depends on um, how many people are on the wait list and how the subsequent rounds shape up. So hope hopefully that's helpful. Yep. And again, yes, I'm to sign up for a free consultation if you haven't already. Check out our guides. Um, and very best of luck to, to all of you.